That may sound logical. After all, we do need a lot of money out there. It doesn't say exactly how much. And we need to understand exactly how much. I, I demonstrated this, you know, this example of a, a circle where everyone has $10 and they turn to the person to their left and they give their $10 for that person's work and the person to their right um, gives them their $10 for their work. The only reason that can happen is everyone has a representation of their work. And, we, and if we're denied uh, representation of rightful reward, how can we possibly uh, 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 fail to suffer offense? In fact, of a huge kind, if we produce more than, far more than $266 or whatever it took to produce the gold that, 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 that is dis would, would distribute equally per capita. You know, if we've done more work than that, how can we possibly be rewarded by doing more and more and more and more work? It just cycles around. You know, what if we saved it? You see, we couldn't even save but $266 a person, you know. So, yet he's saying somehow this math is, 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 is only sounds logical on the surface on the surface that may sound logical after all we do need a lot of money I mean I would never say such thing a lot of money that's so obtuse that's so indefinite a lot of money out there to keep out there in circulation you know to keep the wheels of the economy turning but upon examination this turns out to be one of the most childish ideas imaginable imaginable one of the most childish ideas imaginable does that sound like an authority to you good night I mean if that was the first paragraph <laughs> I, I mean I just had a vision of you know finding Griffin and making him eat this book but anyway he goes on <laughs> you know uh, first of all it is estimated that approximately 45 percent of all the gold mix Mined throughout the world since the discovery of America is now in government or banking stockpiles. Well, that isn't going to do us a lot of good, is it? You know, if we're going to trade our work by what gold we have, and then how are we going to get the gold from the government? They're going to give it to us? They're going to divide it among, uh, uh, amongst the, the, the circulation that exists. Well, is that the number that, that Griffin's really hoping for here? I don't think so, because he represents a, 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 a pile of gold bugs. They're undoubtedly, undoubtedly, when somebody uses the word undoubtedly, hmm, hmm, I'm shaking my head, is there undoubtedly is at least an additional 30% in jewelry, ornaments, and private hordes <laughs> well of course if you tell me that I ha I would have no doubt of it whatsoever you know there is no way in the world I would ever doubt that if G. Edward Griffin said it to me especially when he just said the math that we were just discussing is the most childish one of the most childish ideas imaginable hmm so we're not to have a circulation which is equal to the remaining value of all represented wealth, one of the most childish ideas imaginable, and somehow a quantity of gold which isn't even close to that is going to fix everything, when, especially when we have money subject to interest. I mean, this guy is just preposterous. I mean, this is, I just go down and just grab something, you know. The deeper reality, however, is that the supply is not even important. The supply is not even important. Then why do you throw that other paragraph in there? You know, 75% of its total production since Columbus discovered America can hardly be described as in short supply. The deeper reality, however, is that the supply is not even important, he says. Well, why even write this chapter? Just give us a proof of why the supply of gold isn't important. Suppose there was only one ounce in the world. The supply wouldn't be important. It doesn't take long to test that statement and find out this guy's an idiot. You know, and we're idiots if we're buying crap like this and saying, oh, we have to return to the gold standard. You know? Remember that the primary function of money is to measure the value of the items for which it is exchanged. Well, if it can't be in the same unit and it can't be in the same volume, how can it possibly measure it then? 
Jeez, this is this is like a measure of our own inability to understand anything that we assimilate as knowledge. How do we let this slide? In this sense, it serves as a yardstick or ruler of value. How can it possibly? I just asked. How can it possibly? Is he showing it? Showing how? No, he's just stating that it does when the first questions we ask prove it can't. How can it be a measure of the value of, of industry and production if the industry and production go up or down at all? Can't happen. The measurement is different. How was it ever a measurement of value? Never was for a moment. Not for a fraction of a, split, a second, but in Griffin's feeble mind. It really makes no difference if we measure the length of our rug in inches, feet, yards, or meters. Yeah, but if there's the length of the rug is changing or the numbers of rugs are changing, it certainly matters if they're supposed to be measured in a volume of gold. This is just trash. Let's just skip to the next paragraph. If the supply of gold in relation to the supply of available goods is so small that that a one ounce coin would be too valuable for minor transactions, people simply would use half ounce coins or tenth ounce coins. Well, excuse me. You're saying then that the value of your money is 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 changing, or it can't possibly uh, uh, measure the value that it has to measure to to be immutable. And which is which which of the two options serves us? An immutable money or one which is always changing? You know. And where's the principle? Why haven't you stated that principle? Because you can only find it in my work. You know, and you don't want to give away the fact that you borrowed from me when you when, from your first sentence of this page, which is which which reads it is it it often is argued that gold is inappropriate as money because it is too limited in supply to satisfy the needs of modern commerce. You can't even read well, Griffin. Yes, that idea comes from me, but you can't even read well because it isn't that it is in too small of supply; it's that its supply differs perpetually from our industry. That's the matter at hand. In the back of this book, uh, he's got a whole set of natural laws. <laughs> natural law number one. When gold, this is the lesson, when gold or silver is used as money and when the forces of supply and demand are not thwarted by government, intervention, the amount of new metal added to the money supply will always be will always be closely proportional to the expanding services and goods which can be purchased with it. Oh my God. Can you believe that anyone would say that? That's on page 592 Appendix, Natural Laws of Human Behavior in Economics. He just said, he just said the, 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 the supply isn't even important. And now he's just claiming that the supply is all, always matches what it needs to re represent. Just somehow. Is this science? You know, this isn't even alchemy. I'm sorry. This is a person who is so arrogant and airheaded that they don't even realize what a eternal disgrace it is to have written these words i'm i'm frankly i'm frankly astonished you know i i i can hardly believe you know what this book is 600 pages of this. Six damn hundred pages claiming what we can easily see through is the truth and somehow all of it validates the gold standard. Just somehow because G. Edward Griffin says so.
you know, this book is just filled with garbage. It's like, here's the title of a, a, a section. This is page 95. The Hidden Agenda, World Socialism. So, <laughs> excuse me, I'm going, oh my God, again. It's like, you know, if you want it, if you want it, if you wanted to 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 enlighten people in a in a serviceable way which which provides for us you know to return to our businesses you know you, you show how that works you don't throw out some obtuse accusation that this is all about world socialism i'm sorry mr griffin it's about a very thing that you advocate and that's capitalism you know that's really what it's about am i an anti-capitalist well in truth you bet i am and the reason that i'm anti-capitalism is capitalism is a lie under the lie of capitalism Capitalism is supposed to be necessary to and equate to free enterprise. But capitalism in its entirety revolves around banking and therefore this very obfuscation of the currency, which dispossesses all of us who produce everything to these mere pretended bankers who are just modern money changers who inevitably inevitably then inherit the world for producing nothing this is why i'm against it it's mutually exclusive to true free enterprise people like the austrian economist g edward griffin ron paul talk about free markets as if a free market is subject to usury Ron Paul isn't decrying interest. He's ad, ad, actually advocated elevated rates of interest. Elevated rates of interest would have discouraged us from borrowing, when in fact, so long as we remained able to service our initial debts under elevated rates of interest, we could only have borrowed more principal back or interest rather back into circulation in order to maintain the vital circulation so we could persist in servicing those initial debts, thus increasing the initial debts by ever greater sums of periodic interest on an ever faster escalating sum of debt. The greater the rate of interest, the faster the sum of debt escalates and the faster the precipitation of, of artificially imposed terminal failure. Wake up people, you know, there isn't a question of whether this, no reasonable question, as they say in, in, in patent law, you know, uh, there is no reasonable question that this obfuscation of the currency not only explains the whole of our present predicament. You can't claim that Bretton Woods would, you know, help us some. Why? Because our promissory obligations are never, 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 never in the rightful possession of banks that they could ever, ever, quote, invest, unquote, them as they do in, quote, capitalism, unquote. Why? Paid principal is only rightly retired from possession. It is not the property of this lie of a banking system. Never, never, never is it the property of this lie of a banking system. We do not borrow money into circulation. We issue promissory obligations. The banking system merely publishes evidence of those promissory obligations, which evidence we call money and represents those promissory obligations for which the banking system never gave up lawful consideration. No debt exists to the banking system, but an obligation indeed does exist for us to pay the principal out of circulation since the real creditor, who is we as well, one of us gives up property 